Hello, everyone. Welcome to Catalog and Cocktails. It's your weekly, honest, no BS, non salesy conversation about enterprise data management with tasty beverages in hand. I'm Tim Gasper, longtime data nerd and product guy at Data.World, and joined by Juan. Hello, everybody. I'm Juan Cicada, principal scientist, Data.World, and as always, Thrilled to go spend my middle of the week uh, afternoon with Tim and guests to talk about data. And I'm really excited to have our new guest today, Lior Gavish. He's one of the co-founders of Monte Carlo Data. Lior, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Yeah, we're super excited to go talk about what you guys are up to and talk about data observability, reliability. This is definitely a hot topic that we're seeing and you guys have a great point of view here. Uh, so just as a quick reminder, right, data.world slash podcast, take a look at our new website, follow us on Twitter on Honest No BS Data and on LinkedIn, and uh, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts and follow us on Spotify. Uh, for everyone who is listening live right now, um, remember, you can always join us live. Uh, take, a, take 30 seconds. Please go, if you listen to us through Apple Podcasts, please go right now, and we would appreciate you rating and be honest honest about it it's like we would truly appreciate that so yeah if we suck please tell us no yeah honestly <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me i'm good i, I just want to be honest good about OBS, yeah Leo is well, you can wait Don't afterwards and you can wait afterwards and then tell uh give the honest review about Leo here too <laughs> <laughs> all right putting you on the spot here well, well let's uh start off with some uh what are we drinking what are we toasting for what what, what, what do you got going on juan well i got um a gin gin meal cocktail and i'm still on this whole passion fruit thing so i did so instead of just doing simple syrup i did um a passion fruit syrup and one of my new favorite gins is the botanist that's what i'm working on right now i love like, the botanist that's a good one how about you uh, i am drinking a daiquiri which actually i've been making it a point to try not to repeat cocktails on catalog and cocktails so i have done a daiquiri before but this time i did it with demerara sugar so i i have made a modification so fyi <laughs> that's fancy fancy how about you Lior? i know we put you here on the spot but i'm uh, i'm uh, i'm gonna go on a straight whiskey today uh it's my favorite <laughs> drink uh so i'm happy to to get an opportunity to enjoy it uh, on a data podcast. It's exciting. awesome. Never well, done that before. So Excellent. let's, what, what are we, what are we cheering here for today? I'm going to start off saying it is beautiful in Austin right now. I'm looking out my window and it's just, I don't know, it's like 65 degrees, uh, nice and sunny. It's a beautiful day. I'm going, I'm after this, I'm going outside and just spend some time outside. Hey, I'll cheers to that too. <laughs> How's the weather in the Bay Area or where you're from? Uh, it's uh, it's actually pretty nice uh, the last few days, so I'll, I'll toast to that and also to the uh, great people that have work, been working on vaccines that will hopefully allow us to go out and, and drink those cocktails outside again soon. I, I'm uh, really excited about that. Amen for that. So cheers. I love that. Cheers, cheers guys. And cheers, cheers. And talking about cheers, we got our, our, our funny question of the day, our, our ice breaking question. Are quality wines worth the extra price? Uh, I, I hear that you are. Uh, you have an interesting uh, perspective on this one, Lear. An interesting perspective. Um, <laughs> I think they're worth it. I mean, uh, if your uh, palate is good enough uh, to enjoy it, uh, then why not? Uh, I know some friends that uh, that create wines or food and have a very, very sensitive palate and, and uh, it's a great investment and they can really enjoy it. Um, I'm probably closer to the vast majority of people who couldn't tell red wine from white wine in, in a blind tasting. Uh, so uh, so I'm, uh, I'm probably on the medium range side, probably up to the 30 to $50 range is my, my high end, but um, uh, but I totally get it. Uh, if you spend your money on, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on this. For, for me, my my favorite bottle of wine is uh, the one the Prisoner from uh, the Prisoner Company from former Orange Swift. It's like forty dollars. It's not cheap, but it is totally worth it if you like really bold wines. That's me. Nice. How about you, Tim? What do you think? 
you know, uh, I may not, uh, my palate may be not sensitive enough. I may be in that category of people, <laughs> you know, me, me, uh, you know, it's funny is this reminded me of me and my friends, uh, you know, pre COVID times, uh, we, uh, would do these blind taste test types of things where we would buy a, uh, a $10 bottle of wine, 20, 30, 40, 50. And, uh, and then we would, we would make it so that we put them in cups. We don't know sort of which one's which other than it's like A, B, C, D, E. Uh, we do, we did it with a Pinot. We did it with, uh, you know, Cabernet. And then, and then, uh, we were always just like a scatter shot and it was almost <laughs> always like, you know, it was always kind of like, uh Oh, you were the one who picked the, like the box of wine. And it's like, well, it tastes good. It's sugary, you know? So, you know, All and, right, we can, we can, I, I we don't can... know really, but it, it's still fun. You know, uh, good wine is good wine, regardless of the price, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, we can keep talking about wine, but we're here to go talk about data. So, but in the meantime, post in the chat, tell us where you're coming from. What are you drinking? What are you toasting for? And what wine do you like and what type of wine you like? So, yeah. So for the, from the quality of your wine, we transition to the quality of your data. data. And do you trust your data? So Lior, tell us a little bit about yourself and Monte Carlo data. I mean, we've hearing a lot about you got y'all get funding. Like you guys, there's a lot of chatter about y'all on the street. So tell us more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, where do I start? I, uh, I'm Lior, I'm one of the co-founders of Monte Carlo. Um, we started out in 2019, so uh, about a couple of years ago, um, with the mission of helping uh, data teams deliver trusted and reliable data at all times. Um, me and my co-founder uh, both uh, come from different backgrounds. Uh, I came from the kind of data engineering side. I was building uh, machine learning for fraud detection uh, and kind of struggling with, with the challenges of building, you know, a product that is driven by data and driven by uh, models. Uh, my co-founder, uh, whom I'm also married to, so it, it makes it a lot more fun, uh, came from the analytics side of the house, kind of helping companies adopt uh, data and use it to... to operate their businesses and kind of all the, the challenges that come with that. And we both kind of um, had experiences around delivering uh, both reliable and unreliable data and, and decided it was, uh, it was a great opportunity to go out there and kind of uh, build something that people could use to, uh, to do that um, with less effort than we, than we had to invest in it. So uh, that's kind of how Monte Carlo started. We've, uh, We've come a long way since, and, and we're excited to work with with some great uh, data teams across the industry to uh, to accomplish our, our mission. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a fun journey. So, so, the honest no BS question, right? Let's start with that. Is you have you data reliability? You guys are using a lot the term data downtime. I've seen a lot the term that you guys have used data observability. A lot of words that can be interpreted in different ways, right? Okay, so honest, no BS. Let's put those words away. So what is it really that you're that we're focusing on here that we should be focusing on? What does this all mean? Oh, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I'll start with data downtime, uh, which is actually the problem and what, what got us thinking about this problem in the first place. Uh, data downtime, at least the way we define it, refers to uh, the times when uh, the data that's being delivered to stakeholders, the data that people use, um, is somehow wrong. Uh, it could be wrong in many different ways or inaccurate in many different ways, but, um, but the fundamental problem is that people are looking at it and assuming it's correct uh, and making the wrong decisions uh, based on that and or um, building models that are making uh, bad decisions based on bad data. So. That's kind of the problem we're all struggling with. Um, I will say that part of the problem is also, even if the data is right, but the organization doesn't believe that it's right, maybe it's perceived uh, as downtime, that's, uh, that's equally bad because it creates a lot of noise and, and uncertainty and uh, an effort for everyone. Um, so data downtime really refers to that problem of like how to, you know, how to make sure that the data products that we deliver as, as data teams, how, how is the product that we're delivering to our customers, um, how would we make sure it's, it's uh, high quality and, and highly reliable? Uh, which leads me to data reliability, right? Data reliability is really that, um, 
measure of how frequently uh, are we experiencing uh, data downtime, right? Like what, uh, you know, if I get really technical, what percentage of the time uh, do we have the right data uh, that's highly trusted? And what percent of the time are we perceived uh, as providing low quality data, right? And that's, that's the idea of data reliability. Um, and uh, going to data observability, data observability is kind of the solution, right? It's um, the way to uh, get to reliable data. The way we get to kind of minimizing data downtime is by introducing observability into the system. And observability is a concept that actually comes from, uh, from uh, other disciplines, from specifically from DevOps. Um, it's a kind of a methodology that's been developed over several decades, uh, mostly by software engineering and kind of operations teams. Uh, and it's the idea that in order to uh, deliver a high quality, highly reliable digital service, uh, you, it needs to be observable, right? You, you need to have some visibility into the health of the system, into the health of the product that you're delivering. And if you have that visibility and you have the ability to understand that issues are happening and how to, uh, and potentially have the information about how to troubleshoot and fix them, uh, then you're going to get more uh, reliability and less uh, downtime, right? So these are all uh, terms we borrowed from, uh, from other disciplines and, and uh, we're trying to uh, get them into the practice of, of data engineering and data analysis and um, and apply it. There's some some things are very similar, some things are quite different, uh, but that's that's what we're here for to to, to figure that out. Well, that's super interesting. It's it's cool to see some of the cross pollination here of some of these ideas, like you said, you know, observability, a concept that's been around in software for a while now applied to sort of the data quality domain or sort of data in general. You know, we talk about, you know, data product management as being a very interesting topic, you know, thinking about how it's interesting how this stuff is kind of crossing, crossing boundaries here. And, you know, obviously data quality has become something that's very, very much a hot topic right now. Uh, right. And, and there's sort of a, uh, I think of it as like a data ops and a data quality kind of boom happening. And obviously y'all are, are part of that. Um, you know, why is data quality tooling becoming cool again? Like what, it, what, it, you know, it feels like it had its moment and I was like, man, data quality, well, let's talk about AI right now. It's like, coming back. like, what's that all about? Also to add to this, like yeah, yeah. what you're, what you're saying is not new, right? We've had all, we've, we've always been having these issues, right? For the beginning of enterprise data and something like that. Right. And, and we have all the, the, what's called the standard or legacy technologies, right? The informaticas of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So, why is it is it a is it a, an issue of that tech doesn't work and there's new tech that's needed, or is it more about the practice? And we could use we could use that old tech to ensure that we eliminate, I mean, reduce downtime, have high reliability, have observability. So, how much of what you're presenting, how much of what you're talking here, is it just processes and people versus there's actually new technology that's needed? Oh. And, and, and I'm connecting this all too with, with, with why is it cool again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, those are great questions. And, and, and I think it's, uh, it's everything, right? It's process people and technology. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain uh, what I think has been happening. Um, I think the major shift that we're seeing is just the way data gets used. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, if you look, I don't know, 20 years back, um, data used to be mostly something that a small team in the finance department used to do. Uh, you would create reports. You would typically create them once a month or once a quarter. Uh, you would have the opportunity to kind of review them and make sure they're absolutely correct before uh, any kind of substantial stakeholder gets to see them. Um, and overall, the complexity of those systems was limited. Um, you would maybe grab information from your ordering system and kind of uh, munch it a little bit and, and, and serve it to, to the end customer, right? So the quality and reliability of that process was governed by manual labor. 
at the end of the day. And that worked because if you only need the report once a month, you can spend the time to, um, to, uh, to craft it and to perfect it. Um, what's happening today is a completely different way of using data. Um, you have companies across the industry uh, where uh, almost everyone is staring at dashboards all day long, um, usually, or sometimes in real time, sometimes like a few hours or a day delayed, uh, but data gets used in real time all the time by many, many people in the company. Uh, so that's one thing that's happening. The other thing is you're starting to put um, machine learning models that make automated decisions based on data, right, in real time. Um, and so like the, the process of kind of having people looking at it all the time and trying to make sure it works, uh, it's just breaks. Like you can't do it anymore. There's too much, there's too much data going around uh, too many users, uh, too much real timeness uh, to do it the old way. Uh, and there's also a lot more data sources, right? Like you're not looking at your uh, ERP anymore. Uh, you're actually bringing in information from many, many different systems across the company and also kind of third party uh, external to the company that you don't control. Um, so the complexity really increased and the requirements uh, of, of reliability really went up. And I think that's why it's kind of, um, it's becoming cool again and important again. Um, the, now going back to technology, um, I think historically data quality has been something like, um, you know, let's make sure we didn't get uh, nulls uh, in, a, in our ID field that we really care about. Uh, and we do it when we ingest the data using uh, Informatica or whatnot uh, with, all, uh, uh, with all due respect to Informatica. Uh, and, and that was kind of it, right? And that was good. And there was a lot of kind of checks and balances later. Um, now you actually have pipelines that are uh, tens of layers deep, sometimes more, and some of the larger environments we're seeing. Um, and every step of the way uh, can have an issue, uh, both within the data warehouse, data lake environment, and the BI layer that sits on top of it, or the modeling layer um, if, if you're bidding, if you're building machine learning, um, and any part of that puzzle can really introduce unreli or unreliability or downtime, if you will. Um, and so you really need to look at the problem in a more holistic way and kind of look at things end to end from source to, uh, to consumer to VI tool, right? And, and, and you also need to start looking at things that go beyond, uh, am I getting nulls? Like, uh, is the data even up to date? Did I get all the data that I was expecting to get today uh, or this hour or this minute? Um, so it's just uh, the, the problem has become much more complex and that, that's kind of what's been driving, I think, the, the technology shift here as well. But one of the things that concerns me a bit is that, okay, definitely there's more complexity. And, and, I, and you bring up a good point that there's just many layers, right? It's, it, it, there's, there's all these, there's just so many people now involved and there's so many layers that it's hard to go manually keep track of these things. So you wanna be able to observe and see what's going on. But okay, we observe, okay, flags are, we gotta go do something. How much of it are we just, are, are, I mean, if we're trying to, if our goal is to reduce or, or, or increase the reliability, as humans, we're like, well, that's our metric. I'm going to go make sure I'm going to max I'm going to maximize reliability. I end up just doing a bunch of band-aids instead of really figuring out what is the true source of the problem. Mm -hmm. And and this is this is what really concerns me is that we just we, we start we have this application mindset about things and we need to go, uh, okay, yeah, we got more people are going to go access the data. Let you you do a, a another pipeline of data and you do another pipeline of data and we're like, but why are you doing all these pipelines of data? Let's truly understand what is the data you need and try to try to strive to have that single understandable model and reduce that complexity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I mean, this is the stuff that, that, that I, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not truly convinced, or I think that there is going to be a path to have a bunch of band-aids and that's going to come back and bite us back very, very quickly. And, and that's my concern. No, it's a, it's a valid concern. And, and we see it all the time, right? Like we, we, uh, we get into environments and like, you might have um, even a hundred thousand tables there, right? Uh, sometimes more. Um, and you're asking yourselves like, why do you have 
a hundred thousand people. Like, what are you doing? Do you even know what's in there or yeah. how it gets used? Yeah, right? How like, did you get into this situation? Right? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of money uh, over a lot, a lot of, of years. <laughs> a lot of time, a lot of people, and, and poorly of, applied. <laughs> oh, exactly. And people, this stuff works. Don't touch it. But let's put it around it, and that's how we get to it, right? Yeah. No, and, and I, I think you're absolutely right, Juan. Um, it is. It is a challenge, and and we've actually started calling it uh, data debt, also borrowing from tech debt, right? Mm. Um, I like it. I, I I think part of like or, or some of the most uh, elite teams that I've seen um consider solving the that problem part of um of their kind of reliability initiative if you will right like part of doing that right is making sure that you know what's out there and that you also know what matters right like what is being used how it's being used uh does it even matter and kind of mapping that out um and prioritizing and 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 uh, taking a look at, at reliability from that perspective is actually uh, critical, and uh, and 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 I, I think there's a lot of different answers to that question, like how to reach that ideal model. Um, I'm not not trying to sell data catalogs here, but a data catalog is super helpful, right? It starts answering those questions. Um, another thing that's from our world of observability uh, is kind of understanding how data gets used. Like part of observability is understanding um, who's using a particular data set, how that's getting used. Um, and if you have that information at your, uh, at your fingertips, um, you can start making more informed decisions about, okay, that, that, do I even want to fix this thing? Does it even yeah. matter to anyone? Yeah, that, that's something I really like. And it's, a, it's about, I think the data observability is not just about Oh, if the data is wrong or whatever, it's like, yeah, how is it, how is the data being used? And but also you understand that quantity, going back to our wine analogy here, right? Quantity and quality. Quantity does not mean quality, right? If right. people are using or a lot this data or downloading this data a lot, doesn't mean that that's that they were supposed to go do the right thing. And on the on the other side, maybe this this data set that hasn't been used that much is the right one to go do. And I mm -hmm. think this is when we have to be careful. I, all the people focus on the technology. Just give me the logs because the logs will tell me. It's like the, the logs yeah. will tell you one one slice of the story. Yeah, but that's not that's not the whole thing. So you need don't to don't equate usage people. with uh, value, right? True, true. I think uh, you know these are all the uh, data points, and uh, like any data point, you should take it with a grain of salt. Um, yes, an informed user would have to take into account. I think. Uh, a lot of different aspects, and, um, and I think uh, you know definitely everyone on this podcast. Um, you know, part of our mission is to to help bring up those data points and start making sense of them, right? Like, um, I think like for, again for some of our customers, they just have a hundred thousand tables and no clue what they are, and like starting to collect that information, that evidence, and those signals. Um, it's kind of a first step. It's not sufficient, but it's it's a to start. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that 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 leads into a broader question here, which I think is really interesting around just trust, right? Like what, what does it mean to be able to trust your data and have the right signal around that? You know, what, what's your perspective on like trust signals? Like what, 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 what should you be focused on? What's the right way to present that? And what, why is it still such an unsolved need? Oh, uh, I think it's just like humans, right? Like start, uh, trust starts with, uh, with transparency, right? Mm -hmm. Like being able to understand what's behind and I'll take like the, the dashboard uh, example here, but uh, it, it applies to other data products as well. Uh, but you're looking at a dashboard on whatever, on Looker or Tableau, whatever it is. Um, how do you know, how do you trust this dashboard, right? So. There's, diff there's, there's various signals um, that we could use there. Um, some of these are around like knowing uh, where that data came from. Like that's the way we've been calling lineage, right? Like uh, what are the sources of data here? Uh, how it's being used? Um, there's various, um, you'd probably want to know what other people said about it, right? Like um, that's maybe something that, that a catalog helps with. Like, what have other people 
done or said about this data set? Has it been helpful to their needs? Um, you can look at various um, even basic things like um, it's part of the observability story, but uh, freshness, like is this data be, is this, is the data that underlies this dashboard even being uh, updated or is it just someone uh, running an experiment three years ago? And, um, and if you can answer, if you can start answering all these questions and provide that information, uh, you, you immediately increase the trust uh, in that dashboard, right? Like just know it, just uh, allowing the user to see it uh, adds trust. Now the yeah. next level of course is to have an operational process to really kind of identify issues or anomalies or things that could possibly be broken in the system and going about um, fixing them if necessary. Um, and that's kind of like the, you know, this again, borrowing from the DevOps world, there's a certain discipline around how to minimize downtime and, and really uh, reduce it. Um, and that's kind of like the next level of getting to to trust in data, but it starts with transparency, I would say. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, just real quick as a follow up to that, you know, yeah, data quality dashboards and scorecards and green, yellow, red and certified. And do, do you, do you have a particular take on like, what's, what's most valuable? Is it like whatever matters to your company or are you like simpler is better? What's your, what's your quick take on that? Oh, um, I think the first question there is who's the, who's the user. Exactly. Mm. Uh, yeah. Juan, do you want to take the, <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I mean, I, I think I mean, you're going to give the same, same answer. Well, no, well, so, <laughs> I mean, so if if you're if you're a, a business user and 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 by the way, I'm using this term business user, but our but our but our chief product officer John is I, I like how he's pushing us to say be more exact. Like who is this business user, right? So, but if you're so let's say that you're a business analyst or you are a person who they're being asked you to go create some reports, right? It, you just want to know, can I? I want to simply know if I can go trust this. And for me, it's like. It has been approved. Is there is there a green there? And I also want to know who approved it too, mm -hmm. or right? Mm -hmm. Because you know what, I'm 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 buddies with Tim, and I trust Tim, and we're good friends. Yeah, Tim proved this. I yeah. And if there is an issue with that, or if I start looking, I, I know I can reach out to Tim, and that's like mm -hmm. that's that level of trust I want to go do. Um, if I'm if I'm more of a a, a, a data geek, a data engineer, like I, I'm going into, I'm going to go use this stuff, or I'm a data scientist, right? I'm I'm going to go actually go do it. Like I want to have more details about this. This 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 green thing is like ah, that's bold, that's BS. Like let's go into the details here, and and I and going and very specific. Like I'm interested in this column of data. Uh, I, I want to know. I mean, very specifics about it. So I think it really goes into depends on the users, right? That was what Juan said. What Juan said is <laughs> perfect. Uh, I agree with it a hundred percent. It really depends on, on the consumer, uh, right, and their level of technical uh, interest or knowledge, uh, right. And you know, maybe the CEO of the company just wants to know that someone. Uh, is looking at it and it has certified well, guess, it. And that's the, all they need to know. The CEO says the, the CEO is already kind of under the assumption that everything I get better be a hundred percent that I can trust. Exactly. So they don't have to go think about it, right? They wouldn't even be a consumer of that. Yeah, <laughs> maybe they don't even need the check mark, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I, th yeah. there's a comment here in the chat from Shane who says, in the software engineering world, if a release fails, typically something breaks. Everybody's affected, and they typically know they are affected. In the data world, no pun intended, the data still turns up and the fact it is broken is often hidden. And, and, th th and this, is, this, is, this is the issue that I, I mean, I'm, I think I'm saying this whole analogy all the time. Uh, we ne and in software, we would never push code to production without it being tested, peer reviewed and all that stuff because something would break the CICD product. But we do this all the time with data, uh -huh. right? And, and should we be that, should we take that, and should we learn from, uh, from, from software engineering and like literally you can't push it, like it's broken, you can't, it, it doesn't stop, it can't go through? Should we be that way? Um, yes, and <laughs> oh. uh, we should. I think, um, you know, uh, adding the equivalent of like uh, unit testing and integration testing and, and CI, CD, uh, can be very powerful with data, and maybe uh, we data practitioners have been going to wild west there, 
uh, with very little testing. Let's just ship it to production and hope for the best. So I think that's a definitely an important piece of the puzzle. Um, I think it's more challenging to do that with data or we don't yet have good methodologies and good, um, good enough ideas on how to fully execute that vision. Uh, but I think it's important and I think we, we need to, to kind of think through it and figure it out. Um, the other side of it, I would say is, um, uh, and, and it's the same with software, right? Like you do all the testing, you have your CI CD in place, um, and then you ship to production and then you monitor, right? Like you don't just hope for the best. Uh, you keep track of what's well, going on. That's what on we do in scrappy startups, right? I remember did it in my first startup. I was like, let's push this out. And like don't tell them. Don't tell them. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> yeah, spilling all our beans here. Um, but um, but yeah, in the same way that in software engineering, we do we uh, we presumably uh, monitor production and and try to make sure it's behaving the way we we intended it to. Um, I think it's it's equally important to do it with data, and and that's an approach that we advocate for, and that that we'll, that we work hard to to do because um, as much as you can do with testing and validation upfront, uh, data just has so many dimensions uh, and so much uncertainty that um, uh, that it's really hard to, so to should, catch should all we these just, for fraud. Should we just wait till something breaks and then go? I mean, how should we start? Right. So I'm thinking about it. So there's like big companies, legacy companies, applications, right? They're like, okay, they want to go get on this modern stack and how should we start? Um, and then you have like the new modern companies, the companies that are startups now, right? That they're all dealing with data. Like, I think there's two different types of companies here that mindsets, like how, how do they start? Like my immediate reaction is, well, for the legacy ones, like just start where, you know, things break and then go fix and kind of, maybe start doing that band-aid approach and see, but for somebody who has the opportunity to kind of start clean, right? How, how would you start? Um, I think, um, you know, if I start with a clean slate today, um, which is what we did two years ago when we started Monte Carlo, um, I'd probably uh, put together some good uh, data testing practices. And we internally at Monte Carlo use DBT for that. Um, so kind of put guardrails and, and kind a of- quick base. note, Drew Bannon is gonna be on the podcast next week for DBT. So. Awesome guest, awesome guest. Uh, I'll, I'll join. Um, so that's definitely, uh, you know, something to start with and, and, and put discipline around and, and that's helpful. Um, the other thing, and I'm, I'm obviously biased here, um, is to put monitoring on your pipelines. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, again, I can't avoid plugging in, but like uh, solutions like Monte Carlo that really monitor your pipeline allow you to, uh, to get started and put observability in place and monitoring in place uh, with a very small lift without having to hire uh, armies of data engineers. Um, and I think with that combination of testing and monitoring, uh, you can build a really good foundation of, of trusted data in the organization. Um, and it's important to do from day one because uh, once you lose trust, uh, it's really hard to regain it. It's also something I'm kind of uh, taking from the human world to the data world. But, uh, but if you screw up too much, um, uh, you might not be trusted even once you fix it. So, uh, so it's something that 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 we start from day one, and and we believe is uh, is good practice. Yeah, establish trust from the beginning because once you lose it, then it's hard to you have to earn it back, right? Yeah, and then people revert to like, oh, this dashboard is broken half the time anyway, <laughs> so I'm just gonna decide whatever I wanted to. Uh, well, I'll just, do in the first I'll just do it on my own. <laughs> I'll just do it on my own. And then I just create this new ad hoc pipeline that nobody knew yeah. about and nobody's observing and then blah. Let it's me create my own silo because at yeah. least I can own and manage it, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think kind of preventing that in the first place um, is is uh, is a good thing before you get too much data debt. I mean, I'm all yeah. for technical debt and data debt. It's 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 unavoidable, but uh, but you want to manage it just like your personal debt. You don't take, hopefully, don't take too many mortgages. Uh, just one or two, whatever you can handle. 
Um, same thing with with building data pipelines and uh, and and software uh, products yeah. as well. That makes makes total sense. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll I'll use a Juan line here. Thirty minutes goes by very quickly. <laughs> uh, this has been an awesome conversation. I know that Juan and I have been vigorously taking some notes here, and and we're very excited about this conversation. Um, you know, at this point, we do some takeaways and we do some uh, some some last final questions about uh, about who you know your final advice and who you think we should talk to next. So uh, maybe Juan, do you want to start off with what what are your biggest takeaways? Yeah, so I love the data debt thing. I that's something I can't believe I. I haven't even said it myself before, right? Just take it from tech debt, we have data debt. And there's so much data that we like, do we need this data or not? But I, one thing I'm taking away here is that we also probably have pipeline debt. We need to be careful about it too. And, and, and these pipelines are so complex. There's sometimes many, many layers deep and, and, and that's what can cause this down, data downtime. And that's what we need to observe with these data, with these pipelines or what's going on with them. But we gotta be careful on on the band-aid solutions like yeah we may need them urgently but we need to kind of think about it from the broader picture and finally that last thing you said like tr trust is something that you gain right once you lose it it's hard to gain it back and this is not just uh life <laughs> this also applies to data <laughs> <laughs> sure how about yeah. you tim what are your takeaways uh, many lessons to learn here well, you know one thing that resonated was when I asked you about the trust signals, you know, is it scorecards, is it green and yellow, red? I think the, the who aspect uh, is really important here. And it, it really resonates with a lot of our other conversations with other data experts is that it, a lot of the who, the persona, you know, it matters a lot, right? If you're a, a person building a dashboard versus if, if you're the data engineer who's responsible for the infrastructure, obviously a much deeper level of data monitoring is, 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 is not only important but critical right so i think who is important and uh and i love this conversation about data having many dim dimensions and and having to take a multifaceted approach right it's not it's not just about dashboards it's about process it's about methodology it's about testing it's about implementing a broad approach to observability right and and the thing that i noted down here was that as, as we were talking and as you were talking leora i was thinking that like interesting data quality actually feels a little bit more these days more like less like software engineering, even though obviously we're borrowing a lot of concepts from there, it feels more like cybersecurity, right? It's like this concept of the hidden threats. You're not sure exactly where those threats are coming, Great but point. you know what the vectors are, right? Mm -hmm. And you can mitigate against them and you can and you can manage and observe against them. So I, it's just, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah. I well, happen to come from a SecOps background. So. They're, they're, they're not it resonates with me. Yeah. <laughs> so as, as I mentioned earlier, two final questions. One, What's your advice? Very broad question. And second, who should we invite next? Oh, uh, good one. So advice. Um, um, I'll, I'll, since we talked about trust, uh, it just reminded me uh, a quote that I heard from my, uh, my previous boss uh, that really stuck with me, which is um, to gain trust, you have to extend trust, right? So that kind of uh, taught me to, uh, to first, uh, believe withhold judgment. Uh, and, um, and that served me well in my career and, um, in, in working with other people. So I'll, I'll share that advice. Love that one. Love that one. Uh, I'll share that advice on, um, and for next guests, um, I'll call out, uh, call out two people. Um, one uh, is uh, Niha Narkede. She's to be the co-founder and CTO of Confluent. Um, very inspiring uh, engineering leader, knows a lot about data, uh, helped a lot of data teams out there, uh, working on a new startup. She's an entrepreneur now. So uh, super uh, inspirational uh, lady. Um, and then Another person that I've I've recently talked to that that I found uh, very interesting is uh, Kevin Stumpf, CTO of Tekton, which is a super interesting uh, ML ops technology, uh, and Kevin is a great guy. Uh, so, yeah, those awesome. are great guests to have. Great, Lear. Thank you so much. Well, it was a pleasure having you here today, and. Uh, Cheers and for trust, trust in data Cheers for and, trust. And, and trust everyone. Georg Gavish <laughs> from guys. Monte Carlo Data. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks.
Thanks, guys.